We are so pleased to have you here today. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Of course. The old saying goes that the only constant in IT is change, right? So we're seeing technologies like containers, serverless computing, um, and a lot of focus on applications. How are your customers adapting to those changes, and what is VMware doing to help them out? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I'd say in the early days when folks were thinking about containers, I can't tell you how many times I heard, well, containers are going to get rid of virtual machines, and that's the death of VMware. And we were thinking, huh, you know, we, we don't just do virtual machines, we do a lot of other things. So you think about our strategy just relative to the core business, it's really about enabling globally consistent infrastructure as code, giving you consistent programmatic compute and networking and storage and security no matter where an application runs, no matter what format the application is in. And that's beneficial because if you think about the container ecosystem, all containers, all applications, no matter how I abstract the application, I need programmatic compute networks and storage and security. And a lot of the container vendors, they have a lot on their plates. You know, they're looking at container cluster scheduling and management, all these other things. So the role of VMware in this ecosystem is really about uh, enabling uh, these platforms with that programmatic infrastructure layer and providing consistent audit and operations and these kind of things so that you can run applications anywhere. So it's very complementary, I would say. You know, even uh, you mentioned serverless, and even in some of the more emergent areas like serverless, we have a lot of customers that are saying, you know what, I like the idea of serverless or functions as a service, but what really concerns me is it can be like a black hole. Where is my compute happening? Where's my data? And they're, they're coming to VMware and saying, you know what, can you help us from a privacy perspective? Can you enable a private serverless approach? Or can you help us in our factories where we want to enable serverless computing, but we have concerns with latency to the public cloud? Or we're generating so much data that that's not even really feasible either. So there's lots of different areas, I'd say, that we're certainly working in that ecosystem. So going back to cloud a little bit, do you have specific guidelines or advice you give to customers about how to move to the cloud successfully or how to adopt those technologies? Yeah, how, how much time we got? <laughs> we use a few hours, is that, is that good? All right, now look, it's, it's very complicated, right? I'm not gonna sit here and say it depends and solicit the eye rolls and all that stuff. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use an Uber or Netflix example either. So this is a Uber and Netflix free zone up here. Uh -oh. But in all seriousness, look, when you think about cloud, it's really important in my opinion to have a tiered strategy, to start thinking about things like there's great provider native services out there that provide tremendous value. And what we're saying is go and use them. You know, I, most customers have strategic commitments to Azure and Azure services, and they should. You know, VMware is a huge Office 365 and Skype for Business organization. We do a lot of collaboration online using great Microsoft cloud services. We do a lot of work with Amazon cloud services as well, and we should, and, and everybody out there should. You know, when you can get tremendous value from these native cloud services, go and use them. Our, our, our approach in this space, and the way you want to think about this, is for a lot of those native services, the challenge that you have is you, you wind up going into this thinking, probably I'm going to depend on these provider native APIs, provider centric APIs, and odds are these apps and services that I build there might live and die on that cloud provider. And again, you're going into this as a strategic business partnership, so that's okay. But if I step back, then I say, well, you know what, there's some, probably some areas there that I want to at least have some commonality of management. So maybe I want to have consistent network and security policy that I enforce, or a way to do true audits and cost management, or to provide an SLA dashboard. You know, those are some areas that we're trying to invest there. But if you go a little bit further out, you also, and we see this from a lot of organizations, they say, you know what, I have these strategic commitments to cloud providers where I'm using their native services, I'm getting great speed and agility, but I'm probably giving up at least some flexibility in terms of redeploying applications in other places. It's not that I can't do it, and it's not that things like containers don't help because they do, but I still wind up with operational drift. I redeploy an application somewhere else, I might do audit in a different way. I might have to do change management differently. I might have to do backup differently. So it doesn't mean that you don't eventually get there, but it could still cost you time and money to do it. So to, to solve, or at least to help contribute to solving that challenge, when you're looking to have control of your intellectual property, I want to pick the open source projects that are important to me. I don't want a provider to dictate the maintenance schedule to me. I want to have control of that too. I want to be able to redeploy an application anywhere. Right, this is where the work that we're doing around our core business, giving you consistent programmatic infrastructure and consistent access to all of the open source APIs that matter, whether that's Docker or Kubernetes, et cetera, right, and allowing you to run them anywhere. 
So you start to think about cloud in terms of saying, OK, well, these I just want, I want that quick agility. I want the speed. Let me put them here. And I'm just going to look to centralize these aspects of management, perhaps. And then the other part is to say, you know what, I want this more flexible infrastructure. But the bottom line here is we have to think about cloud in terms of getting the most and the richness out of the public cloud providers themselves. We don't want to just try to dumb all clouds down to the lowest common denominator. To me, that's a, a, that's a losing proposition. That's certainly not what VMware is trying to do. We're trying to be very strategic to pick our parts to, to add value where it makes sense. And it's important for end user organizations to really be opinionated to say, you know, here's my standard. I want to put this type of application here. This one's more strategic. I want to have more flexibility. So it's going to go on this model that's a bit more fl uh, flexible and cloud agnostic and so on. So having that discipline is something that I don't see a lot of enterprises have today, and it's certainly something that we need to develop and, and be better at as an industry. That's a great point. Um, when it comes to cloud, it's also affecting how your customers are probably thinking about networking and security. Could you address that and the, the interdependencies there? Yeah, I mean, networking and security today, in, in some ways, we look at the, the breadth of solutions that are out there and in, in, in many cases, we have organizations that are applying a static circa 1990s based architecture to a highly dynamic threat model today. It's, it's like saying, you know what? I love Las Vegas. I love Foreigner. I love Queensryche. And I'm going to just stick to those Vegas bands and I'm going to live the dream. Right? You're like, leave that stuff in Vegas. Right? Leave your networking approach, that legacy networking approach, here. And, and we have to think differently about it. So if we think about cloud today, we think about where the cloud innovators have gone. So you think about Google, you think about Facebook, you think about Amazon and others. They're moving a lot of the value of their networking stack up into software because that gives them a lot of flexibility. VMware, we believe the same thing. We believe if you move your IP into software and I can abstract the networking plane, then that gives me a lot of capabilities in terms of providing consistency across different clouds, giving me a consistent way to do security policy across different clouds as well. And being able to start to think about securing applications by the name of the application container, not by the IP address. You, know, you look at most enterprises today that I meet with, I ask the same question almost every customer I see. I say, do you have firewall rules where you don't know what they do? And they're like, yeah. And I said, I bet you're afraid to delete them because you don't know what they'll break. And they're like, yep. So firewall rules today have the lifespan of plutonium. right? They, they never go away. So if we can start to pivot and say, let me base security on the application container itself using technologies like micro-segmentation, the application moves, the security context goes with it. It's a completely different paradigm. It's a different way to manage. And, and people look at this and they're like, whoa, no, that's just too disruptive. If you're using software overlays, I don't have to go wholesale migration. I can just pick a use case. I can pick one application and start to build institutional knowledge to operate differently. And also, by the way, there's lots of innovation that's going to continue to happen in hardware. We have all of these ultra low latency scenarios. We have ways that we can offload analytics into hardware. There's lots of innovation for hardware vendors, too. But the point I'm trying to make here is specific to networking and security. We need to do it differently. Our network and security needs to be as agile as the applications and services we manage. The, the fact that I, I would deploy at a container in a millisecond or a few milliseconds and have to wait weeks for network and security policy to be provisioned is inexcusable today. And we, we can't continue to, to operate that way. So like I said, you know, th those old approaches, you know, they, they had their time in the sun, right? They, they've, done their, they've done a great job. They're like, you know, New Jersey, they're, they're the Bon Jovi of networking. Great. Right? It's time to move on. We need new approaches. So you talked about moving across clouds and having that flexibility. And VMware announced a partnership with Amazon that took a lot of people in the industry by surprise. Um, what kind of feedback are you getting from customers, and how is that benefiting them? Yeah, it's been, it's been really exciting, I would say, the, the, the response to our Amazon partnership. Just our wait list alone to, to onboard customers for our beta is more than 1,000 customers. So it's been tremendous in terms of folks wanting to take advantage. And the way that they're looking at these solutions is to say, you know what, I have Amazon services that I want to take advantage of, but I also have applications that are already running in the VMware environment. So if I can co-locate them together, I can start to get the best of both worlds. We have a lot of organizations saying, I'm looking to consolidate and shut down data centers. I want to drive costs away. And, and when we get into just the topics of transformation, they really believe in agile IT and programmatic infrastructure and all these things, but they're so worried that their individual IT contributors are too reluctant to change or can't change fast enough. 
I have organizations I work with that just said, you know what, we're throwing in the towel. We're going to just uh, move these things to the cloud. We want to do it quickly. We want to get all those advantages because I don't think internally we can, we can pivot fast enough. So we see that too. We see disaster recovery as a service. And then the fourth one, which I think is the most important one, and I alluded to this earlier, the code that we're running on Amazon is the same as what we're running in IBM Cloud. It's the same as what we do on our VCAN partners. It's the same as what we do out at the edge using our stack and technologies like Cloud Foundation. So what this means is I can build new applications on Amazon. I can leverage some of the Amazon services. And when I package that application or service, I don't have to know its future. I have flexibility. If I want to be able to deploy that out to the edge, or I just don't know where it needs to go, or maybe a natural disaster is going to knock out connectivity to an Amazon data center, and I need to get it actually out onto private capacity sometime in the future, all sorts of different contingencies, they're saying, you know what? Building this on that VMware stack makes a lot of sense. And the key, too, to our strategy here, like I said before, is not just giving you this native VMware API experience. If you want to build using Kubernetes, you can natively integrate into our stack using uh, our Kubernetes in integration. You can use uh, some work we're doing with uh, the Kubo project with Pivotal and Google. Uh, you can use native Docker APIs with vSphere integrated containers. So the bottom line here is you can make these investments will completely abstract the presence of that VMware infrastructure underneath. And if you don't like your relationship with VMware, pack up and go. Go somewhere else. We are, we are trying to just win your business on merit in these things. And we think that's how it should be. And I don't think it's just a VMware vision. You know, you look at what Microsoft's trying to do with Azure Stack. I think that's another good example. Right, to me, this, this is just the way that the industry is moving. You know, we're trying to just play our part. So you mentioned the edge, and that made me think about Internet of Things. What's VMware's strategy when it comes to IoT? Yeah, IoT has been pretty interesting for us. It's, some people say, well, what does VMware have to do with IoT? You know, we get those questions sometimes. My favorite IoT experience, this is a major US auto. We had walked into a meeting uh, with their CIO and CTO. It was myself and Greg Bolella, who's VMware's IoT CTO. Greg's a really smart guy. He's been in the embedded systems business for about 30 years. So we go in there. Their CTO looks at Greg and I, and he said to us, if you even talk to us, try to talk to us about the connected car, we're going to throw you out. So we said, all right, let's not talk about that. We said, actually, good, because we've been doing a lot of work helping organizations in their factories and their plants. Because what's happening is, you know, they have lots of different sensors that they're building. They have lots of different gateway devices. A lot of times these gateway devices are running on different hardware. And that's a natural use case for virtualization. If we can virtualize the gateways, we can actually simplify and standardize the infrastructure. What we're seeing from the IoT gateway manufacturers is if they can run VMware code on their gateways, it's much easier for them to get that, that solution integrated into enterprise IT and in the management stack because the enterprises already have standards based on VMware. So in IoT, we're doing things like Leota, little IoT agent that's on our GitHub page. That's an open source IoT agent which can run on anything that runs Python, which is practically any device today. It's a very small uh, uh, Python code footprint. So we're, we're seeing organizations that will leverage that code. I can plumb that into any type of management or monitoring tool. We'll do VR ops because we're VMware, but you can use it for anything. You know, that's one example. You know, you look at these, the breadth of devices that are out there, our uh, experience in AirWatch and supporting a, a, a multitude of different mobile endpoints has also allowed us to do a lot of work around management of not just the endpoints, but the experience. So we're working with an auto manufacturer today around uh, managing their different uh, uh, cars themselves and the, the technology that exists in the cars and all of the sensors. Uh, we're also working with a lot of organizations that are really concerned about plants and factories. Because this is where analytics becomes really important. They're trying to mine a lot of data at the edge. But we have enterprises today that are telling us by 2020, they expect some of their factories to generate a petabyte of data per day. The challenges that they have here is that all of that data to them, it's not something they can, they can ship to the cloud. That's, that's not even an option. And second, in many cases in manufacturing, the data is so sensitive that they don't want it to ever even leave the factory floor. So if we can provide appliances that can allow them to move that capacity uh, or move the compute and the analytics out to the, where the data is, that's a lot easier than trying to move the data to the compute. So these are natural organic places that we're seeing a lot of interest from us in IoT. We have a couple dozen customers today that are using our software in these variety of IoT use cases. Uh, we just announced our uh, uh, IoT uh, VMware Pulse IoT management platform that's going to allow you to, to centralize all of this. So you can see that on our website. So we're investing pretty heavily there. We're seeing some good success. All of this has really been grassroots and organic. The couple dozen customers that we've built has really been with a, an engineer just going out and talking to people, which is Greg Bolella and also Mimi Spear on, on his team. Uh, it's been with zero marketing. It's just really been word of mouth and people seeing what we're doing. Great. 
So we've been talking a lot about technology, but I know that one of the largest concerns for our audience is probably the people problems. And I know that you talk to a lot of IT leaders in your role. What challenges are they facing and how are they adapting in their organizations and their own personal roles? It's a great question and it's a conversation I have with most CIOs that I meet with. The challenge that people have is we know we need to change. We know we need to be more agile, right? But we're at the same time, us in IT, we're builders at heart. We love to build things and we feel really good at the end of the day when we're building things. But the challenge that we have with that is a lot of times what folks are building in IT today, at least in IT operations, is effectively a commodity, right? And you heard that in the previous keynote that 80% you know, of our work is on non-differentiation, right? Non-differentiating things. So how do we change that? We have to start to say, you know what? I don't need to build everything anymore. Every business in the world needs to do agile, scalable, secure, programmatic compute network storage and security underneath their applications. Everybody in the world has to do it. So if it's something that everybody just needs, why on earth is every one of us building a custom way to do that? What's the point? You know, think about it. The point is, there's an IT services industry that massively depends on you doing that. Right? They reap tremendous rewards. It's great for their profits, just not yours. If we can up-level the conversation right, and start to think, let's use bigger building blocks. We're still building, but we're just building in a more agile way. So even in our data centers, leveraging hyper-converged technologies gives us an easy way to do that. And I'm not saying that's going to fix everything, because we have lots of apps that need TLC and specialized hardware and things like that, of course. But we have a lot of other apps that don't. And our newer apps are being written to scale out when they need new capacity. They're not being written to scale up. So more generic compute models can really help us. So now what does this, get, what does this mean to skills? So if we're starting to up-level, I was getting there. Just <laughs> be patient. Ask. I was getting there. I can be verbose. I'm sorry. It's from New Jersey. We Doing talk great. fast. OK. So for skills, it means you know, I, there's a lot of fear out there. If you're saying, hey, wait a minute, I'm going to automate this part of your job, people can be like, whoa, time out. Wait a minute. No. Uh-uh. I'll throw up every roadblock I can because I'm trying to feed my family. Right? People's lives are at stake here, and it's important. And, and we get that. So the way that, the way that we, can, we, the way that we can get people moving forward is to show them what their future is. Tell the security administrator, you know what? You're not going to be logging into ServiceNow every day and opening a service ticket and handling a rules change request and closing the service ticket and doing it again. You've been doing factory work. I'm taking that off your plate. I'm automating it. Now you're going to be researching emergent threats. You're going to be ahead of these things. You're going to help us to be more agile and reactive to how the ecosystem is changing. This is what your future looks like. Your storage administrator, yeah, you're not integrating servers and storage anymore. That's just happening automatically. But we have this bigger problem in terms of managing our data lifecycle across all of these different cloud environments. I want you working on that. There's new and exciting career paths for everybody out there. And it's really important for us as IT leaders to articulate what those are. And then we'll get folks buying in. Because as long as they see the future, they get very excited about it. That's great advice, I think. So I'd like to thank you again for being with us today. And it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for the opportunity.